Thank you so much for being here. And um, I'm loving the song choices. We need to add a little Beyonce to the mix. Um, thank you both for being here with us today. An thank you. exciting topic at hand. Um, so Saudi Arabia is going through an incredible transformation. Tourism spotlight has been turning towards the country. So I'm just going to throw in a bit of stats. The World Travel and Tourism Council expects expect Saudi Arabia's travel and tourism market to become the fastest growing in the Middle East, forecasting it to grow at an average of 11% annually over the next decade. By 2032, the sector's contribution to Saudi's GDP could reach nearly 635 billion Saudi rials, which is around $169.3 billion. So, um, Kieran, it's been a busy year for Saudi Arabia. What are the key highlights for Dar'iya? Walk me through the numbers in terms of visitors and spending. Sure. So um, I think it's been a busy six years for Saudi Arabia, but it seems to be squeezing into um, a lot happening in 2023, with a lot yet to happen in 2024 as well. With the Dar'iya project, it's um, hugely important for us uh, that we now tell the world what it's all about. And it's obviously we're building a city, an urban city of the future. It's a pedestrian city. The first phase of Drea has a subterranean complex infrastructure, and it changes the quality of life proposition for a city within the capital city that is Riyadh. Uh, in numbers, we're talking about a project which is 63 uh, billion US dollars, and we're talking about a project which will be home to over 100,000 uh, new inhabitants. We're also responsible currently for a very large supervisory area, which has an existing population in excess of 100,000 uh, locals to Dereya. So we have to be sympathetic to that. We're building this city, but the city is also going to be a, a, a prime center for culture and heritage and a huge destination point uh, on the global stage for tourism. So with, within the next seven years, we expect to see the majority of the project fully completed, and that's in several phases of Dereya. The first phase, we expect that to see uh, completed by 2027. Within those phases, we've got in excess of 38 uh, luxury hotels and global hotel brands that have partnered with us. So that sets in motion what you can expect from uh, the destination as a tourism proposition. Obviously, sustainability is hugely important with us as well. So when we talk about quality of life, we are repopulating 2.6 square kilometers of wadi, which exists within Dereya and defines Dereya. And to do that, so far to date, we have planted in excess of six and a half million trees and plants and shrubs. So the greenification and the importance of that natural environment to the urban city of the future um, is the key to the Dereya project. We were having a little chat uh, behind. They were talking about Dara'iya and how it's a magnificent and, and the heritage and all. And you're doing a great job with Dara'iya. I mean, it's, it's an amazing destination. Um, over to you, Marluz. Um, Kirtan Hospitality already has a presence in Saudi Arabia. Last year, you're, you opened Cloud 7 Residence Al Ula. And earlier this month, the company launched a $400 million initiative to unite its Saudi Arabia project under one umbrella. So tell me more, why did you decide to tap into the Saudi market? Did you find a gap? And uh, what potential did you see? And how are you redefining the hospitality experience? So when we uh, started Curtin Hospitality eight years ago, um, the entire philosophy of the company was to find opportunity projects that were connected to the communities and that were creating hospitality products that were not related to size, but related to the location that were placed in. When we started coming to Saudi Arabia seven years ago, it wasn't really kind of on everybody's radar yet. But Dubai was quite a, quite, um, the inventory of, of kind of branded keys was significant. Saudi Arabia didn't really have that, but when we did the research, 68% of the population was under 35. And a lot of that group was looking for different products. They were looking for lifestyle. They were looking for hospitality that they could identify themselves with. 
And so when we started um, with Project uh, in, in JED originally, we grew that out, um, and today we're working on projects in Abha, Yambu, um, Alula, and Alula goes from a 300 key uh, Cloud 7 to a boutique lifestyle product in the old town of Alula. Um, we're working with the Ministry of Culture on the activation of Al Balat and the houses there. Um, but all the products are focused on sustainability, community, true community, art integration. And when you look at the market today, people are looking to be something new, be something different, go to a destination because there's something that they can learn, something that they can do, something they can shop that they cannot shop anywhere else. And really what is truly important to us is that when you wake up in the morning, you have a sense of Saudi Arabia. And preferably, you have a sense of Yambu, you have a sense of Abha, you have a sense of Hale, for that matter. It doesn't matter where you are. And so when you look at the products that are, that are being developed, there's a lot of replicas and there's a, a lot of kind of products that are focused on interior design and architecture. What we do is we sell the experience to the census. We sell the arrival experience. We sell, you know, even patterns. It doesn't have to be the pattern of up high. It could be something modern that gives you kind of this modern twist to something that you know. Um, and Saudi Arabia, for that sense, yeah, has so much opportunity, and that's why we launched the collective by Curtain Hospitality, because it's so much easier for people to remember one umbrella that unites similar kind of project types than remember the house, Cloud7, by Curtain Hospitality. And people like to travel different brands. People like to tra travel mid-market, five-star luxury, uber luxury. Um, and so for us, Saudi Arabia, we placed our teams here, is a significant market because there's a willingness. There's not just a, a commercial benefit to being here. Um, Saudi, the tourism in Saudi is really booming. And it's, the country is creating something really unique and appealing to the global market that may not have considered Saudi as a destination for them previously. So how are you changing perception, creating interest, creating demand? Uh, it's a great question. How do you? I think the first thing that you do is you are as authentic as you possibly can be. And this is the wonderful thing about the direction of travel in Saudi. And this comes from all the way to the top, um, from King Salman and His Royal Highness uh, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Authenticity is the most important word. And it really makes a difference. When you come to Saudi, uh, you, we had a conversation about this yeah. earlier, right? Um, you, it, 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 it's really enriching because you're interacting with Saudis. You can go to many parts of the world and you're interacting with a transient population where you may not actually interact so heavily with the local population, but it's just all the people powering the travel and tourism environment. It's lovely to arrive into Saudi Arabia, interact with a Saudi, from the immigration experience to getting into an Uber to going to your hotel check-in, you have that authentic interaction because they're real people from this part of the world. And I think that's absolutely key to that experience. Um, as Marlos was pointing out, you've got a young population. They're looking for more meaningful ways to interact with the world around them. Uh, you're looking at, tr at a, a trend in tourism which is looking for more meaningful experiences. You know, I've had enough of going to the five-star luxury resort and going to the spa. It's great to have it there because that's just what I do on a rainy day. But I want to have this authentic experience. I want to take it home and I want to be able to tell people how meaningful it was to me and what I, you know, what I went through. Um, and so with that trend, Saudi is a natural appeal because it's also got this off, off the beaten path kind of a quality to it. Yet, as Marlo has pointed out, the, the full range of what's on offer is those ultra-luxury hotel experiences all the way down. Uh, so it's got all of the ingredients for a very exciting uh, destination and exciting experience for just general tourism. I think the other part of what makes it so meaningful is just the feeling within the country. The ambition is just enormous, uh, but so is the dedication and the commitment to seeing it. 
And so we're learning on a daily basis how to interact with the world. It's changing, it's moving very rapidly. Um, in Drea, in the last 12 months, uh, we, we launched the project in November, and from November until present day, we've had over a, a million visitors come to the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, that's, that's a huge amount given uh, the way in which we've opened it, and we've tried to, to, to be as modest as we can. Uh, with opening in a slow capacity so that we could really look after that audience and give them as meaningful and enriching an experience as possible. I think if we stay in that same formation, um, I think that tourists will become those ambassadors for us, the, the more and more that they come, and you'll start to see that spread. But also those real Saudi moments of exchange and experience, that's where the ambassadorial behavior really takes hold. And it's fun for us because you can come to Darea, and you can have a conversation with, say, one of our tour guides in Aturaif, and they'll be able to say to you, yeah, because my grandmother used to live over there, and you're walking past somewhere which was really meaningful to them, and they impart that, and you take that home with you wherever your home may be around the world. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think a lot of tourists come to a country because of the people, the hospitality, um, and... I've, it's my first time in Riyadh, and I've, I've loved it so far. The people are so kind. Uh, I think first impressions always count, doesn't it? Yeah, when absolutely, you're absolutely. But you need a reason to come. <laughs> and I think the first times, it's events like these. It's, you know, in the beginning when we were all seeing the big concerts um, and the large events and kind of the, the extreme version of being part of, the, you know, the, Islam, the Islamic Biennale. I don't know I've seen it. Incredible. And everything that's done is really up to the top of the delivery. Mm -hmm. And with that, you bring specialists from all over the world. You bring scientists. You bring people that just want to be seen. You bring all of those people. They start spreading the word. And actually, it's working, right? Because it's creating this curiosity. It's creating this, oh my god, I didn't know there's beautiful seas. Yet I didn't know Ampa has the the Japanese blossoms, you don't need to go to yeah. Japan, you can just, you know, go on a one and a half hour flight. But you need, you need to, you need it to expose. You can't just say, oh my God, we have the greatest hotels, now everybody will just come. Mm. It's just not going to happen. That's, that's very true. I really want to delve into a Saudi woman in the workforce and uh, within the, the sector itself. So, the WTTC forecasts employment in the sector to double over the next 10 years. And the female participation in the workforce in Saudi has also increased based on the latest figures and data. So where does the female workforce come into play here and within the sector? How are women supporting and driving the transformation in the area and, and overall in the country, especially as well as in the hospitality industry? I mean, it's... Would you like me to go first? Go first. So... I think the really exciting thing about the Drea project, and I'll, I'll give you the statistics and then I'll remind you of something really remarkable. So within our organization, we are just under 2,000 employees. 36% uh, of our employees are female. 16% have senior manager or above positions. Um, I'm also really proud to say that 14% of our company are from Drea, the Drea natives, right? So they speak with an authentic voice, a meaningful voice. Um, with that 36%, just bear in mind, we are building a city of the future. We're one of the largest construction projects in the world today. So just picture in your mind hard hats and high-vis jackets, right? And for us to have the 36% tells you what tractability travel and tourism as a sector has, regardless of gender, also regardless of age. And it's a fantastic thing because everybody has a voice and within tourism and within travel, what's appealing is to connect on those authentic voices. And so you have to have that wide diaspora of the community. Um, and that's, that's a very exciting thing. So when we see these figures, they're great figures. It supplements you know, the fact that we're also over 80% Saudi in terms of our Saudiization rate within Drea. Um, but the important thing is that this is just going to continue, and, I, and, I, and hopefully the next time we have a big event like this, there's a word on the board behind me which isn't there 
because it doesn't need to be there because there's 100% neutrality and equality in how we perceive, uh, particularly the travel and tourism sector. And what's your thoughts? So 68% of the Kirtan Hospitality team is women. And I think women supporting women just helps so much and it, it's so meaningful. But to take this one step further and a bit more practical, we launched Nakati, our gelato brand. We launched it here in Saudi Arabia, specifically in Riyadh. We gave that opportunity to one of our leading Saudi foodpreneurs. We gave the project. She truly adapted the flavors, the bases, the recipes to Saudi flavors to bring something to life that resonates with people. And it's, it's quite interesting because when she describes the yogurt flavor, which gives the dimension of when they were kids, they had the yogurt with bread and sugar. Just this is something that can sell easily. So with that, we are expanding and we're actually, it's still called social franchising, but we're supporting female entrepreneurs with this. A simple concept that can be run by anybody a first-time entrepreneur, giving people the opportunity to take something that is supported and mentored by an organization like ours, and we're, we're an operating company, right? We operate hotels, branded residences, service departments, and F&B. With that infrastructure, with our entire teams, the team we have here, the team we have in Jeddah, the team we have in Dubai, uh, the specialists we have floating through Europe, we can truly support this entrepreneurship. And I think you know, what's always been really important to us is that we take a quite equal approach. So you won't find a business plan that just sets up, we need this amount of this and this amount of that. We really have created a company where we can scale modern hospitality, giving individuals the opportunity to drive, to scale, to position themselves and to create a name for themselves with the support of the company. That's interesting. Um, I know we have only a few minutes left. I want to just take a few minutes if anybody has any questions for the panelists. Any questions? No questions? Okay, no worries. That's, that's fine. Um, one of my, well, I had a one question. I had a lot of questions, but um, the question I'd like to ask is what is the future lo looking, uh, look like for the hospitality and tourism sector in Saudi Arabia? Is collaboration key? Is uh, what about eco-friendly tourism? What is what is the future looking like? The future looks amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing. Can you imagine? Um, yeah. Just look at the energy that's currently uh, in Riyadh, where, where we all are right now. Right? Just you can you can feel it's palpable. You walk into any location, any new outlet, any hotel, any summit like this one, um, and there's a high degree of energy um, and ambition. And when you get those two things together, you know that great things are going to happen. Um, within uh, the, the, the travel and tourism industry, I really think the secret is, with this ambition, to understand that it's going to have an effect on the rest of the world. So what we do now in Saudi, for example, if we were to take the lead on sustainable tourism, I think that the rest of the world would start to take their cues from how things are being done in Saudi because we've got the gravitas, we've definitely got the budgets, and we've definitely got the ambition. Um, and so we've got to use that really in, in, in what I love is the three most important words to me in my entire life are always force for good. So if we can take travel and tourism and, and couple that as the force for good, whether that's you know, diversity, equality, whether that's just saying we can do something sustainable that will look after our communities, engage our communities, source local, source with pride, then the rest of the world will take notice and also follow suit. And I think that that's the opportunity that we have, and I think that the kingdom feels it. And so that commitment now seems to be there. I think the, the workforce coming into the sector is there. Uh, so great things are going to happen, and that's, that's my prediction. <laughs> So from our side, we launched the, the collective uh, by Gerton Hospitality with the Ministry of Tourism. I think it's a true example of collaboration. Government sector, private sector coming together to support others in other government institutions and private sector to, to motivate and flourish. The second piece is people are re-looking at spaces. So for example, the development of an urban resort in Riyadh city center, which is doing today. 
ecotourism, but also just lifestyle mid-market, branded, branded residences, you know, at entry level with services. There is so much possible because of the different products that people are looking at. And people are not looking at singular assets anymore per se. They're looking at a space to work, a space to collaborate, a space to potentially shop, or, I mean, we've heard so much about wellness and retail. Um, any of those integrations with a sleeping component, that can be a hotel, again, service apartments, a branded residence. Those products don't really exist today, and there's such a blank sheet of paper that we can today play with if you look at, you know, bringing 100 million visitors to the kingdom by 2030, right? The products and, and the demands for that are incredible. But to your earlier point, unless we collaborate, it's just, it's, it doesn't work as well. Yes, it can still make sense, but it doesn't really come to life. Um, and I think we've heard so much about design and we've heard so much about other industries. If we can connect the hospitality industry with other industries to bring these new products that you, know, you would expect in LA or New York or Paris or London, in Saudi Arabia today, we can do it. And just something on what Marlo said earlier, if I may plant a seed of thought, consider this for a moment. Uh, the first time I came to the kingdom was 2001. Now, the kingdom has had a, a long history of my interaction with friends in the kingdom where someone would say, hey, Kieran, do you want to go bowling? Yes, let's go bowling. Great. Come to my house and we'll go down into my basement and we'll go bowling. Seriously, right? So, no, but what happens? The, the population of Saudis who I, who I call my dear friends, they love to spend summer in London and they are very outdoors in London, right? They love to spend half of their summer in Paris, and they love to be outdoors as well. So there's this externalization from this younger audience, this younger population in Saudi, externalization of who they are. Yet the kingdom hasn't yet provided the public realm to do that. And so that's key to tourism, because tourists don't just stay in their hotel room and then go to the UNESCO site and don't experience anything in between. Public realm is hugely important. Think about walking through Barcelona. Think about walking through any great European city. The public realm has a huge effect on you. The, the artist or the performer who's singing on the corner, um, you know, that's important and that drives that tourism. One of the exciting things about our project being a pedestrian project that does that. It externalizes and focuses on public realm. We need more greenery. We need more parks and parklands for people to interact in Riyadh. And these are all of the things which will change and have a huge effect so that the hotels, we shouldn't get so fixated on them. That's the byproduct of tourism. The appeal of tourism is something much deeper and richer than that. And the hotels serve that tourism. So I think it's important to think about public realm as well. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. Thank you so much, Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.